Welcome back, everybody. Uh -huh. My name is Edward Cunningham. I'm director of China programs over at the Rajawali uh, Foundation Institute for Asia at the Kennedy School, along with uh, Tony Seish. Um, what we're going to do now is switch gears and move from the bilateral, which is a level of analysis I think most of us tend to be biased towards, um, and dig a bit deeper. I think in the end, many of us, or at least most of us, um, are uh, have our heart with the domestic understanding some of the domestic political economy uh, of uh, the PRC, and what are some of the drivers domestically in shaping um, both the, the guardrails and the opportunities in this relationship? Uh, what are the goals of the government? What are the goals of the party? Uh, what are the social factors? How, what is the state of the economy? Uh, and how those contours uh, shape um, opportunities and possibilities. So we couldn't have a better panel, of course, to guide us uh, in this uh, exploration. Uh, we will be moderated by Professor Sage, uh, who introduced himself before over at the Kennedy School. Uh, we also have wonderful panelists, Arthur Krober, uh, who most of you know, founding partner, head of research at GavCal, Professor Yawen Lei, a social professor of sociology here at Harvard, Professor David Shambaugh, director of the China Policy Program at the Elliott School uh, at George Washington University. Um, Professor uh, Susan Shirk, chair of the 21st Century China Center and research professor at UC San Diego will round it out, um, particularly talking about her uh, new book as well. So with uh, that, I'm gonna turn it over to my, uh, my colleague, uh, Tony, and it's, they're in your hands, Tony. Great, thanks, Edward. Um... So we got a pretty clear indication of uh, what Xi Jinping would like uh, to achieve with the third term in his leadership, and even his projection of what he thinks is going to happen up until about 2035. And I think this panel is, in crucial, is crucial because I think if you want any serious analysis of the US-China relationship, it has to be based on a solid understanding of China's situation and also its capabilities and the challenges uh, that it will be facing. Many uh, analysts, uh, particularly some writings out of Washington, almost seem to be, believe there's going to be an inexorable rise uh, of China, that the economy is going to keep expanding and growing. And that gets projected into fear factors of when the Chinese economy is going to overtake that of the United States of America. Personally, I think that's a debatable uh, proposition, and obviously it's impossible in terms of per capita income, if one thinks about that. And this has major consequences on how you view what the domestic capabilities are going to be and what they can project. But what if its institutional and economic fabric is weaker than many outside observers think? What are the consequences of that for the relationship? And as Edward just said, we have four great colleagues who can help us think through these challenges in this panel, and then we will open up to comments and questions. But I think what I'd like to do is start with uh, Professor Shambau, sitting here to my right, because what we need to understand is what is the nature of this beast, the Chinese Communist Party? And Xi Jinping clearly sees the party as the key to attaining any of their policy goals. It was continually reference throughout uh, his report uh, to the party uh, Congress. He talks about the need for a strong, united, disciplined party being vital for China to meet its objectives, whether it's economic, whether it's social, or whether it's global. But David, you present a much more complex picture. And I was interested where you saw both strength, but you also see weakness. And I think you also saw in the report somewhat fear and anxiety. We had black swans, we had rhinos, we had domestic concerns, we had international concerns. So perhaps you can start off with your reflections. Sure. Well, thank you, Tony, and a delight to be here um, and with such close colleagues to try and unpack uh, these complex questions. So let me try and um, respond directly to your question about the, the party and the report. I mean, I think we've all probably read it many times. How harsh is she? Chan 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 Chan, right? <laughs> um, you know, I think I took away from the report exactly that sort of contradictory, almost, I use the word schizophrenic um, character to it. You know, on one hand, there was a lot of hubris, pride, confidence, uh, almost bragging 
braggadocio, you know, bragging through much of it. And then um, there's a profound sense of insecurity, defensiveness um, in, in it as well, which in some ways is a kind of metaphor for the, the regime today, the party today, um, and even the country today. It is both of these dimensions simultaneously. In fact, I, you know, psychologists, psychology 101 would tell you that an insecure human being frequently overreacts, overcompensates, and, um, and acts in hubristic kinds of kinds of ways. I don't know if that's an appropriate metaphor to you know, put the CCP into Psych 101, but um, there, is, there is that contradiction, yes. Um, so I would say that um, the way I would characterize the regime uh, and the system today is neo-totalitarian, not authoritarian. I think we have to revive the term totalitarian in a new phase. It's not identical to either Maoist totalitarian China or Stalinist totalitarian Soviet Union or Nazi Germany or, or but I think there are a number of features that we see today in that regime that lead me to, to use that term or the way political scientists at least and historians have used that term. So let me try and run through just a few of those features that I see. I mean, first of all, overall, I see the party as having been turned into by Xi Jinping into a kind of robotic machine. It's like a military where orders are given from the commander and everybody salutes and implements them or pays a big consequence. It's a, it's a highly disciplined party. Yes, one could say that's his intent, but it's, it's robotic. Now, what's the opposite of robotic? a more lively creature, what the Chinese call Dang de Shanghua, party life. It's a term that goes way back to Yan'an. And every leader from Mao until Xi Jinping used the term Dang de Shanghua. What they had in mind there, Deng Xiaoping in particular after the Cultural Revolution, but continuing through the Jiang Zemin and the Hu Jintao periods, was to create a party that was responsive to its society, you might say horizontally, different constituencies in society that was responsive vertically inside the party, uh, whereby feedback mechanisms were encouraged. They call that inner party democracy, Dangne um, Minju. And, um, you know, it's a participatory kind of party. That was that model that, that Dong instituted. And as I say, was followed until Xi Jinping came along. Um, now it is a highly personalized, dictatorial, uh, centralized, uh, and institutionalized system. One thing that's been institutionalized, Susan and I have been reflecting on, on the 1956 book by Zbigniew Brzezinski on the Soviet Union entitled The Permanent Purge. Uh, she will, I think, speak more to the, to the anti-corruption uh, purge. <laughs> But this is now institutionalized. This is, that was not a one-off in the first few years of his rule. This is now a system in which um, that has been institutionalized inside the party. She has some statistics, which I'll let Susan give you on that. So um, the irony of all, there, there are many other, so there's ideologic, certainly ideology is back. Kevin Rudd has very well described that. Um, um, but what kind of ideology? dogmatic ideology, not flexible ideology, the way Dong had, had turned it to kind of post hoc ideology that would rationalize policy decisions or justify, I should say, policy decisions made on pragmatic grounds. Now, it's classic Marxism, um, very dogmatic, <clears throat> very personalized, right? How many volumes of so-called governance has he published? Good grief, more than Mao's red books, I think, by now. Um, so it's a sycophantic, a one-man rule, an echo chamber, one might say. Um, <clears throat> certainly high degree of personality cult. That's a key feature of totalitarian regimes, all of them. Um, no balancing factions. This is a one-party faction, one-faction party, I should say, <laughs> the Xi faction. Uh, there's no feedback in the system. Um, 
uh, really no pragmatism vis-a-vis -vis the economy or foreign policy. Um, you know, his predilections and his ideology are dictating moves towards the economy and in the external domain that are not in China's best interest, one could argue. The, um, what Susan likes to call the control bureaucracies, which I, I like, are now central. They are in control. Everything has been securitized. If you read the report, sec national security or security, Guadanchen, appears no fewer than 91 times. <laughs> it's the second most used term to development in the report. <clears throat> Everything securitized. There are now 16, Xi, Jin, Xi Jinping defines 16 types of national security in his report. That's an increase from 11 when he inaugurated the national. National Security Commission back in 2012. So it's, you know, growing. Everything now is securitized. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, you know, this is a very, oh, and the report is just emblematic of, the, of a very insecure regime, fearful, even paranoid, and I don't use that word lightly, of external subversion inside of China and containment around China. So, you know, we all know about the ramped up repression and the surveillance state that he has institutionalized over the last decade. There's a xenophobic hypernationalism, wolf warriorism, if you will. There's a total intolerance of civil society, uh, intellectual creativity, or really freedoms of any kind. The planned economy is back big time. Arthur will no doubt speak to that. Industrial policy in many domains, SOEs, you know, DE. Um, so these are all characteristics of a totalitarian state. You no, know, there are some elements that we don't see that we did see in the Soviet Mao's China, namely terror. Right? If you go back and you read Friedrich and Brzezinski's classic book on totalitarianism, you know, but people live in intimidation, but they're not being terrorized and taken off to the gulags unless you're Uyghur. Um, so I think the irony, and I'll just close on this point, uh, Tony, the irony is Xi Jinping has um, spent, you know, an enormous amount of time trying to make the CCP a party that would not follow the Soviet uh, implosion. I mean, he is obsessed, and I would argue his predecessors, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, were both obsessed with the, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, and they have written about that, and we can talk about that, but they... Um, have worked since 1991 to prevent a replay in China, but there were two, there was until Xi Jinping, one predominant way to avoid the Soviet implosion, namely managed opening. Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao both believed in the, Zeng Qing Hong is the one I give credit to, I don't know if Tony and others share that, but managed opening, open civil society, open media, open economy, open foreign relations, open intellectual life, and so on, but manage it carefully. You can always pull back. That's That was their model. The second school of thought that came out of the Soviet internal uh, assessment inside the CCP was, was just the opposite. Don't go there. It is a slippery slope, this school thought. You, it will cascade, manage opening. Opening will cascade out of control, cannot be managed, and you will wind up like the Soviet Union. That is the school Xi Jinping uh, belongs to and had belonged, was part of <clears throat> before he even came to power. So long story short, school number one prevailed during the John periods, but right at the end of the Hu period, and Susan book is superb on this point. What we're seeing in China under Xi actually started in 2009, um, not 2012. So I'll just leave it to her. But I think um, the irony is that in order to avoid the Soviet uh, um, demise, he has he's definitely strengthened the party and the regime, but I, in the short term, medium term, you might say, no doubt about it, compared to 10 years ago, it's a much stronger party. But I would say in the longer term, he may well have weakened it because it's made it so sclerotic, so robotic, you know, and um, that's not a party that is sustainable, in my view. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, that's great. Thanks, David. I mean, I suppose, it, you know, from Xi Jinping, if he looked to 2012, 2013, you know, his argument would be, no, managed openness didn't work. Look at what we've got. We've got Bo Xilai, the problems there. We've got corruption. We've got inequality. We've got local government acting on its own behalf, rather than center, society slipping out of control. 
that's why we need this kind of tougher response and where it's led it to. I think one of the things that, that surprised me with the Congress, and you, you really, I think, have highlighted this, is I don't know any analyst that really expected Xi's dominance to be as absolute, for example, with the standing committee really having only seven. I think people might have said six, five, whatever. But it clearly shows that he has no respect for other opinion groups within the party. Right. And they have no kind of channel uh, into that. And I suppose one of the things, David, that comes up as a, as a consequence of that, and I'd like to ask you, and you talked about it becoming sclerotic, what do those other groups do? I mean, if you're a part of that previous group, right. do you act out of the system? Do you have a way in? What do you do? Excellent question. I was actually going to end on that point, and I, I forgot. That is, there is no doubt enormous discontent in the, in the country and in the system and in the party itself with the direction uh, that she has taken it. Um, but to see that, because uh, we can't go to China, and because the consequences, the intimidation and the, and the real consequences of incarceration are so mm -hmm. severe um, that, but one just senses, you know, 40 years of, of spent half, more than half my life going to China. We know these people, the, the school number one people of the mm -hmm. Soviet, they are throughout the system and you can one cannot imagine that they're happy at all with what's been going on. But discontent does not equal opposition and it certainly doesn't yeah. equal organized opposition. So what do you do? I suspect in situations like this, you, you sort of de facto They'll opt out. In other words, passive resistance, bureaucrats and apparatchiks and cadres just stop uh, being zealous in the implementation of whatever policy they're supposed to implement. They kind of slow things down. Um, and perhaps even uh, and begin to examine in their own minds what it is they're doing. I don't know if you've seen the movie The Lives of Others about East Germany and the Stasi agent, you know, began to sympathize with the people he was monitoring. I'm not saying, but so watch for cracks in the system. Where? Propaganda apparatus, internal security apparatus. Once once the, the cadres and those two apparatus begin to be a little squidgy in the implementation of, of, you know, discourse and security, then these systems hollow out from within. They don't get overthrown from the bottom. They don't fall from the top down. They hollow out from within. And it's the, it's the apparatchiks that begin to get squidgier, you know? Okay. Yeah, I think the schizophrenia in the port was, was quite remarkable. I mean, when I listened to all the glowing parts, I was thinking, wow, I'd really like to live in this place. This just sounds tremendous. And then we got to the Kush uh, with all the kinds of problems, all the kinds of fears that uh, were sort of rolled uh, into that. Um, I think, uh, you know, one, I. I don't believe struggle is gone. And I think even though the six people in the standing committee are all acolytes of Xi Jinping, they're all now going to be jockeying over the future. Mm -hmm. and so I think it'll be a different kind of struggling from what we see. And I think that's something we're going to have to look out for. But I think, you know, one of the key questions, uh, of course, in addition to the strength of the party, helping it meet its objectives is going to be the health of the economy, which is crucial. And so we see the phrases decoupling dual circulation made in China 2025 uh, Belt and Road Initiative. And I see all of those as a part of geoeconomic risk mitigation because of the fears you say were in that report to shield China from what it sees as Western restraints. Um, and I think China is making a bet that it thinks the great powers are the powers that set technological standards uh, of future industries. And I think they look at uh, the US, they see that. And I guess one of the questions there, is that viable with its current uh, uh, economic approach? And can it do that with what it's talking about indigenous innovation? And that also relates to what uh, Arthur, you see as the general state and health of the economy. Thank you. Um... Well, first of all, Tony, I'd like to point out that uh, Made in China 2025 and Belt and Road are, are not phrases that you should be uttering now, according to <laughs> Communist Party guidance. So one of the interesting features of the 
Xi Jinping era is the speed with which slogans and brand names are adopted and then discarded. I think that would be a good subject for a PhD dissertation. Um, so um, yeah, I think to, to pick up on the, uh, the comment that, that David made about the, to use Susan's term, the, the control of bureaucracies um, having a much greater voice in things. I think there's no question, if you look back over the last four years of Chinese economic history, the challenge has always been to manage the party's control agenda with the growth agenda. The control agenda has always been there. Um, and if you, you know, had any illusions about the centrality of that agenda, I refer you to the events of June 4th, 1989, uh, when Deng Xiaoping uh, took uh, pretty decisive action to reassert control at immense cost um, to the economy at the time. So this is not the first time that a, a, a Communist Party leader in the post Mao era has made a decision, pretty large scale set of decisions to reemphasize the control part of the agenda. Um, so, you know, historically, it's always been a tension because the, the primary objective has always been to maintain the uh, political monopoly on power of the Communist Party. But the growth agenda has always run a very close second to that uh, because there was a desire to make the control worth something. And if you control something whose value is zero, that is interesting, but not very important. Um, but the objective is to always to have control over a system which was domestically proper, prosperous and um, internationally influential. Um, and I think the continuity between Xi Jinping and his predecessors is that he shares that same core goal, uh, that he does have an ambition for China to be a much greater player on the global stage. Uh, I think it's also pretty clear that you know, there's an aspiration for China to become the regional great power of Asia, which is one of the reasons that it comes into direct conflict with the United States, um, which has essentially had that role since 1945. Um, and so to achieve this aim of greatness, economic growth and economic development has to be a part of that, it has to be a big part of that. Um, so it is kind of an interesting, if you look at the word count in the, um, uh, a party Congress report. Um, it, it's kind of an interesting question is how you should slice it. As, as David pointed out, the number one term that was used uh, was development. So that's still first. The number two term, which is zoomed up in, in recent iterations of this report is security. Uh, and security was mentioned more often than the economy or reform for the first time. Um, so that clearly does suggest that there has been a, a pretty significant shift in, in, in favor of security and the, if you could call it the control agenda, and, and definitely a downplaying of some elements of the economic agenda. But I think it's complicated. Um, and so if you look, for example, at some of the policy measures that have been taken over um, the 10 years, and particularly the last five years, uh, of the Xi Jinping um, era in the economic realm, I, I think you can see that they combine elements of political or securitized, if you will, um, uh, objectives and what you might call more technocratic objectives in different degrees. Um, so, for example, um, the uh, zero COVID strategy, which has been um, uh, implemented with considerable zeal, um, clearly bears the imprint of Xi Jinping personally. He staked a lot on this individually. I think there's a lot of evidence that he has squashed alternative views. Uh, and that has become a significantly politicized um, endeavor. It is worth pointing out, though, that for the first two years of that policy, this was also economically very successful. China had less COVID and stronger economic growth in 2020 and 2021 than any other major economy. Um, and the problem arose this year when more um, ver uh, transmissible variants made the old strategy of kind of localized uh, pandemic control non-viable. And they're really struggling um, with that. Um, 
And, you know, I think up until the party Congress, clearly the messaging was zero COVID forever, basically. Uh, and immediately after the party Congress, there were some pretty significant adjustments, um, which I think will not have a, a major immediate impact. Clearly, over the next few months, the goal will be to contain some pretty severe outbreaks that they're, they're having, including in Beijing. Um, but I think it does signal a recognition uh, by the leadership that there needs to be a pathway out of this and that cannot be deferred indefinitely into the future. Uh, and reasons for doing that include, number one, that it's uh, pretty bad for economic growth. And number two, it uh, as the speakers uh, uh, in the previous panel mentioned, uh, it's pretty obstructive of a lot of um, but diplomatic, academic, and business activity that is uh, beneficial both economically but also for China's ability to function in the world. So we've seen there sort of a mix of, of control and, um, and, and growth-oriented uh, options. You could look at the crackdown on the property market, which in many ways is an extension of the financial de-risking campaign that took place uh, starting in late 2016, a lot of which had to do with the recognition of a correct recognition that there was too much debt in the system, there was too much um, uh, systemic final financial risk, and for China to have a sustainable long-term growth trajectory, they get had to get a handle on these things. So yeah, you could say this was about control, but it was also quite legitimate uh, from purely economic considerations uh, that they wanted to contain these things. Finally, another thing that has been made much of is the crackdown on the internet platforms. Very complicated issue, a lot of things at stake there. I think it is worth noting that this, uh, although it is rightly um, uh, attracted enormous amount of attention, um, its actual impact on the broad private sector in China is pretty modest. Most companies were not affected by this. Um, and a lot of the concerns that motivated the crackdown on the internet companies are pretty similar to the concerns that motivate regulators in all countries when they look at these large monopolistic, uh, unaccountable uh, tech uh, companies. So clearly there were political elements, but there were also economic uh, elements as well. So I, I view the situation now as uh, essentially a continuation of this long-term struggle that the party has had over decades to manage these growth and control agendas, which are clearly in tension, but clearly to a degree complementary. Um, and so as we look forward, um, I think it is quite clear um, that the economic development uh, vision of Xi Jinping, as, as Tony suggested, is heavily technology dependent. And, and you know, in a sense, this is nothing new. There have been technology development plans um, you know, since the 70s um, or since the 1850s, if you will. Um, this has always been an obsession of Chinese elites to upgrade the technological basis of, of the country. Um, they have definitely become more central um, in the economic visioning of, of Xi. Um, and the, the concern that I would have is that um, economic development is now viewed apparently almost exclusively in terms of industrial policy. I supporting technology intensive sectors like semiconductors, industrial automation, a green technology and so forth. And the theory behind this is, is that if you produce a lot of high technology goods, this will generate high productivity and growth throughout the economy. Um, so from an economic standpoint, I think this is just wrong, um, that productivity comes essentially from making diffusion of technology uh, and financial resources most optimal and creating good competitive environments for you know, resource allocation. Um, and they don't seem to be doing enough of the reforms in the financial, fiscal, uh, and competition realms uh, that would really guarantee that in, in the long run. So I think there's, if we look ahead at the potential growth trajectories for China, I, I think there's a, a two boundary cases that I would suggest to you. One is, let's say that they make all these investments in these high tech sectors, which many of which I think will be successful on a sectoral basis in creating, you know, uh, you know, competitive industries. Um, 
and that there is also a reinvigoration of some of the more uh, market oriented reforms. Uh, and it's perfectly possible, I think, for China to grow at probably around four or four and a half percent for the next decade or so. And that would put them on track to surpass the United States as the world's biggest economy in nominal terms by the middle of the next decade. Um, I think that's conceivable. We can't rule that out. Um, I think the alternative boundary would be they just keep doubling down on this industrial policy stuff. They don't really uh, enable any of these other significant uh, reforms. And then I think you're more likely to see a drift downwards to a, sort of a trend growth rate more in the two or 3% range, which would be not terrible. I don't think that would be enough to upset the regime. I think there would also be plenty of individual sectors within that, which would grow much faster. So from an international investment Point of view, I think China would still be quite interesting to many people uh, under those uh, circumstances, but that would severely crimp China's ability to compete for global influence in the way that that she has uh, has suggested that he wants to. So I think the, the question, basically, on which I am at the moment a little bit agnostic, is to what degree in his next term will she start to permit an adjustment of policies. Um, that are more clearly focused on the broad object objective of sustaining the kind of economic growth that, that, that is really needed for the fulfillment of his strategic ambitions. Great, thanks, Arthur. And that, I think, leads us back to uh, one of the questions that came up in the first presentation. You know, is, would she be willing to listen to conflicting opinions and ideas about economic policy? And there, I think one of the lines that is being spun out of China now, and I've had several people recite this to me, is, well, now he has a group of trusted followers in the standing committee, he might be more willing to have open debate. And of course, Li Keqiang was totally irrelevant as a premier, and now Li Qiang taking over, it was an interesting figure, of course, a huge cock up with uh, the lockdowns in Shanghai, but generally seen as someone who's business astute and business friendly. So again, it'll be interesting to see, you know, how that plays out. Um, two things struck me from what you're saying, linking this back to the US-China relationship. One is, you seem to imply that for it to meet its technological goals, it's still going to have to have considerable international engagement. And also, secondly, if it wants to uh, meet its financial and fiscal roles, it, it, it aims, it really needs access to the global financial market. Is, is that fair enough, Arthur? Yeah, those, those are very good points. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad you brought them up because um, I think you, you use the term schizophrenia to describe the, the uh, Party Congress report. And this is one area where the schizophrenia is, is very uh, acute. So on the one hand, you have a, a very clear self-sufficiency or self-reliance agenda, um, which, you know, I think as you, Tony, have suggested, there's a lot of, uh, there's a large defensive component to this. I mean, they, they recognize that the U.S. Is, is now basically hostile and that a lot of technologies that used to be freely available from the US and its allies may not be so available in the future. And so therefore it really is urgent for China to develop domestic substitutes. So this has been a theme for several years, really since uh, at least since the trade war um, began for China to double down on the creation of domestic technologies. And this is in the area of vaccines, this has had a really toxic um, consequence because they've essentially refused to, to make use of international vaccines in the hopes of, of having a, a domestic alternative. Um, uh, but at the same time, they recognize that um, uh, they're going to need a lot of um, uh, participation in this by international the self-sufficiency drive, if you will, by a lot of participation by international companies because they need the know-how, they need the, the core catalytic energy of direct investment. And also because um, having a large number of companies from the United States and Europe have large stakes in the Chinese economy through direct investments is an important part of the political strategy um, because those companies automatically become a counterweight to 
uh, you, you know, stronger efforts to decouple or to, uh, you know, heighten the political um, rivalry between the US and China. So in order to stabilize their relationships with the global economy and with in the US and its allies, it's really important for them to have a lot of these companies in both for the, the practical economic and technological reasons, but also for the political reasons. So it's very striking that during the trade war and during this sort of uh, accentuation of the technology war by the Biden administration, the Chinese have refrained from any retaliation. Uh, they basically have responded by, in some areas, opening up or facilitating foreign direct investment in, in sectors uh, that were not previously the case, notably biotech. Um, uh, and that seems to be part of a deliberate strategy. So it is it's a very complicated thing that they they want to be self-reliant but they realize that they can't be and so the 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 revealed strategy is actually to try and increase um the interdependence as a, uh, a sort of a defensive hedge against a more um, hostile and unpredictable world great thanks arthur uh, obviously applying neo-totalitarianism is a rather complex business so one of the things that we've seen is quite a significant shift uh, thinking about quality of growth and who benefits. So Yawen, you talked about, or you're thinking about uh, common prosperity, which is a key concept for Xi Jinping. What do you understand that to mean? And can it really address the social challenges uh, that China is facing? And particularly because a lot of those challenges um, really exist at the local level. And as we know, it's local governments that really have to provide 90% of the funding for these public goods and services, yet their financial capacity is now uh, severely uh, constrained. So how do you view these issues? Yeah, um, thank you, Tony. Um, so as a very humble sociologist, I can only talk about um, like um, social problems, and I focus on inequality on now, so um, as David mentioned that um, the government, Xi Jinping, President Xi Jinping tried very hard to, um, to kind of emphasize the role of ideology, but the problem is when you emphasize ideology that much, then how do you deal with the enormous gap between uh, the socialist um, official principle and also the reality of high inequality? So social scientists have been trying very hard to measure, measure the level of inequality. Also, one important measure is uh, Gini coefficient. And then now the best data um, well, uh, social scientists have is based on China family uh, panel uh, studies. And according to um, social scientists calculation, um, the level of income inequality has um, decreased a little bit uh, between 2010 and 2016, but then it began to increase uh, um, in 2016 and increase a little bit um, just between 2016 and 18. So the um, coefficient um, remains at around uh, 0 0.47 to 0 0.53. So that indicates actually uh, the level of in income quality remains stably high, unfortunately. And then, um, and then if we look at uh, distribution of income across different uh, households, so we find that uh, the lowest at the bottom of the society, the lowest 20% household only has around 4.5% of the national income. And then at the, the other hand, the other end, so the highest 20% uh, uh, of household, the highest 20% of house, uh, household has <clears throat> around 46% of the income. So that's a huge uh, disparity. And then, um, so this is just income distribution when we think when we think about wealth distribution the uh, level of inequality is even higher and there is another problem about declining uh, social mobility so as we know that so in the US uh, upward social mobility is quite is not very high but China in China I think they began to have similar trend but the situation is not worse uh, as worse as in the US but the level of income quality is actually higher in China than in the US. So that's a big problem. So how can uh, Xi Jinping kind of uh, deal with this problem? And then there is also a problem about uh, perceived uh, inequality and also trust in government. Um, so uh, my own um, study showed that when people begin to see, uh, see equality, inequality as a serious problem, then it's more likely that they have lower trust um, in 
uh, the government, especially uh, the central gov government. Mm -hmm. And I think this might explain why um, Xi Jinping has tried to initiate this uh, uh, common prosperity initiative. So that's an upgrade version of the uh, poverty allevi uh, alleviation program, because in the past, this uh, poverty program just kind of tried to solve um, the poverty issue of the app, like the absolute uh, poverty. But now he tried to, he wanted to, through this program, he wanted to kind of create uh, what he called uh, all of shape of society. That meaning that you have more uh, middle income group and then have fewer people at the top and at the bottom. And, um, and then he also claimed that he wants to bridge um, the inequality between urban areas and also uh, rural areas and also between different uh, uh, regional air, um, uh, different regions in China. And um, and then, but so far we seen that he had, for me, he has been doing some ad hoc uh, measures. And for example, crackdown on the tax sector, mm -hmm. or I, I'm not sure if it's, pro it's appropriate to say that kind of scapegoat of, of the tax sector. And then um, so crackdown on, on the ad uh, tech. And in Zhejiang, he had a, he chose Zhejiang as an experimental uh, zone to um, to implement the common prosperity program. But then we see that um, I mean, social scientists know that there are structural factors that cause this uh, inequality. So, um, as Professor uh, Scott Rosell um, argued, that educational inequality is a very uh, important uh, factor in accounting for uh, the current uh, inequality in China. And as we know that, um, as he found, uh, Professor Rose found that uh, the labor force mm -hmm. in China actually has uh, the lowest level of education of any comparable country. And that's a huge problem. So that means that in order to uh, boost your economy, you have to invest more in education than where the money comes from. And as uh, Tony said that usually it's the local government's uh, who are uh, that are responsible for paying the bill? And now, um, when we think about the uh, the recent um, uh, economic development in the real estate uh, sectors, and it just um, beg the question of whether there is a sustainable in such there. This kind of ad hoc measures can solve this uh, systematic uh, problem in terms of educational inequality. And in addition to educational inequality, there is also problem inequality, um, increasing inequality in labor market. Um, and um, um, author talk about the Chinese government shift to a more technology and also science developmental model. So that sounds a great idea. And you might we might expect that actually this kind of shift uh, created a lot of problem, a lot of uh, a lot of jobs uh, at, at the high end, for example, like more high skilled um, service job. And it did a little bit um, with, um, I look at the data from 2005 um, to now, and then like high, uh, high skill um, service job have grown. But then the problem is really low skill service jobs are the kind of job mm -hmm. that have been created by the high tech sector. Why? Because um, jobs uh, under in the platform economy don't have social security, don't have urban health insurance, don't have pension, and then no safety. Uh, net, net and to protect people in this uh, newly uh, platform economy. And um, I think I in at last year, so 2021, uh, the National um, uh, Statistic Bureau announced that um, 200 million of people in China now have flexible uh, employment. And what does flexible employment mean? That means basically people who don't have um, safety net. So um, that's people who actually are employed in uh, labor intensive um, service uh, sectors. And then in order to tackle the problem of um, this kind of polarized um, labor market, so there are a lot of this kind of informal uh, employment and how the government can do. So you have to provide more, you have really have to build a more inclusive welfare state. You have to provide money. Again, where does the money come from? That's a fiscal, uh, physical, uh, fiscal problem. And um, so um, in the end, um, 
Xi Jinping, again, uh, just like perhaps the previous central government, uh, have created a lot of like unfunded uh, mandates for local government. And I don't really see um, and a lot of efforts in terms of, for example, like reforming a tax system. So at one point of time, the central government wanted to impose um, property tax, right? And then did the experiment in Chongqing and in Shanghai. But in the end, they didn't really, they encountered a lot of uh, local resistance. And there could, there's also no reform about uh, personal income or tax. And then there is no um, reform about intergovernment uh, fiscal arrangement. So given these conditions, I would think that um, the institutions uh, she has uh, could be very, I mean, could uh, achieve, I mean, very limited uh, goal um, or the hope that he wants to achieve. And I also want to bring out um, the case of Taiwan and also the case of um, South Korea. So both Taiwan and South Korea shifted to uh, what I call techno development in the 70s. But what's different from the Taiwanese, uh, Chinese and South Korea cases is actually the shift in Taiwan and also in South Korea Act, um, happen that shift to techno development development actually that happened at the same time when the process of democratization began. And what does that mean? That means that there is kind of input from the people. There is a political channel for disadvantaged group to influence um, the distribution, the politics of, of distribution. But in the Chinese case, even though she could have good intention, and then I just wonder how um, without the inputs from like labor, from workers, from poor people, and how we can uh, rely on the government, rely on the government's will and the capacity to achieve the goal of um, common prosperity. I think I just stop here. Thank you. Great. That's excellent. I mean, again, another challenge for neo-totalitarian control. And as you said, I mean, most of the um, measures that are needed to resolve this essentially are political and they relate to current interests which have built and you know simply asking billionaires to give away some money is not going to resolve it and as you said it's it's based deeply really in the fiscal system the central local government relations also uh, fiscal policy where you have at the moment structures which tend to shift resources from poorer to richer areas, so on and so forth. So those are major kind of political challenges that we're facing. I think we have to get along in the not too distant future to some questions from the floor, but Susan is going to help us think about this picture. And you've used the phrase overreach, which I think brings us back to sort of where David started off uh, the consequences. Is it feasible in the current environment that China is in where you've got an increasing expanding middle class, you've got a very complex set of social challenges, which Yao Wen has just outlined. You know, you've got, um, uh, you know, multiple interests uh, evolving in society, yet a heavily centralizing political apparatus. So is that viable for China moving forward? So when you write about overreach, what do you actually mean by it? What is driving it? And what are the consequences? And I think also a little bit about the consequences externally, which will lead us into the next panel. Okay. Great. Well, thanks very much, Tony. And um, thanks for the opportunity to talk about my new book on this panel and hopefully encourage more people to read it and debate it. I'm really keen to get feedback. Um, what I mean by overreach is not just ambition, but taking things too far, both in foreign policy and domestic policy, in a way that then snaps back to harm yourself. So it's um, self-defeating, exaggerated actions. And uh, so the argument is that it's really the competition, political competition among politicians in China, domestic political dynamics uh, that drives overreach and that it begins actually, and I, this is probably the biggest surprise uh, that I found in my research, it doesn't start with Xi Jinping. Hmm. 
it begins even earlier uh, and in a system of collective leadership. So um, I'm not going to go through the whole argument if you want to learn more about it. Uh, I, I, but I'm very intrigued by that and I'm pleased that people might actually still be interested in Hu Jintao since he was led out of the 20th Party Congress. So people said, oh yes, Hu Jintao. <laughs> uh, I'd like to learn more about Hu Jintao's uh, collective leadership. But of course that system of collective leadership uh, in which uh, there was peaceful, regular competition among leaders at the top and transfer of power after two terms in which you had uh, inter-party democracy to the extent that the Central Committee uh, really exercised its formal authority to select leaders. You had this reciprocal accountability, um, uh, retirement ages, uh, the decentralization of the system, because of course, provincial officials are the largest block in the Central Committee. So all of these uh, forms of institutionalization, which I once was completely convinced along with scholars like Alice Miller would really uh, be sufficient to achieve the controlled opening that David talks about, um, but it proved not to be the case. So one of the uh, other puzzles that I address in the book is why was it so easy for Xi Jinping to establish this system of personalistic dictatorship after decades of this kind of institutionalization. And uh, the conclusion that I've drawn, especially after this recent meeting of the 20th Party Congress, because we see how there's just no visible resistance to Xi Jinping's takeover and establishment of this type of uh, highly centralized personalistic system. And that's really surprising. Uh, the Central Committee just rolled over. There was no sign of any resistance. So uh, even though I do, you know, Deng Xiaoping is my hero, you know, I think Deng Xiaoping had a very uh, sophisticated understanding of the problems of the Mao era and uh, talked about over concentration of authority, this system leading to arbitrary decision-making uh, and set up this uh, system of collective leadership, which actually harkens back to 1956. And, Communist Party history um, as a check, but Deng did not pursue demaoization uh, deeply enough, fundamentally enough. Mm -hmm. So he depended on the collective institutions of the party, the Central Committee, the Politburo, but he was not willing to allow a legislature or a legal system to have independent authority to check the actions of party politicians. And, uh, you know, I think we need to conclude that that's one important reason that the uh, collective leadership and the institutionalization of peaceful transfer of power within the party did not survive. And it was surprisingly easy for Xi Jinping to uh, seize power. But of course, he didn't seize power. He received a mandate because at the end of the Hu Jintao uh, decade, they had tremendous problems of corruption and uh, and therefore, 
she was able to make the case and it was supported quite broadly within the top reaches of party power that there was a need for a stronger central authority. But of course, nobody reckoned with the possibility of having um, the kind of personalistic system that Xi Jinping established. So let me just um, quickly summarize why I think this system is so prone to overreach in foreign policy, uh, in provoking relations with neighbors and with the United States, uh, creating this counter coalition or coalitions, the backlash against China that has developed over the past few years and that the Biden administration and the Japanese, the Australians are all, and the Europe Europeans now very active in trying to uh, counter uh, Xi Jinping's overreach. Uh, it, and domestically, the costs are also piling up. Domestically, we see especially the crackdown on the private sector and the extreme zero COVID, the inability to adapt to the new variants in any way, um, has uh, created, has contributed to China's domestic economic problems right now. And, uh, and here's how I think the system works. I mean, uh, Xi Jinping this has put tremendous top-down pressure on subordinate officials. And it really comes from this anti-corruption campaign, which is simultaneously a purge of rivals to Xi Jinping, real and imagined rivals, I would say. So according to the Party Discipline Commission's own statistics, uh, up to 5 million officials have been uh, investigated and disciplined. And there's a very large number of senior officials. So David was talking about this idea of the permanent purge. This purge continues. We're now in at least the third wave. And what's striking about it is the latest targets are the inquisitors, the same senior officials from the Discipline Commission and the Internal Security Commission, uh, who themselves were once so trusted by Xi Jinping that they were carrying out the investigation of Zhou Yun Kang and other senior officials. So um, if you so subordinate officials are under tremendous pressure to survive and not be targeted by the campaign and to compete with one another to advance in their careers by somehow proving their loyalty to Xi Jinping. And as I explain in the book, to show their loyalty, they of course have to praise the leader in nauseating displays of loyalty in the, uh, famous words of my colleague, Victor Schur, um, but also by jumping on the bandwagon between she, uh, behind Xi's policy preferences and then carrying out his policies to an extreme, uh, over compliance and uh, to an extreme, maybe a greater extreme than Xi himself may have originally intended. So the uh, incentives within the system lead to this kind of overreach in wolf warrior diplomacy, picking fights with your neighbors, uh, provoking the United States, and then internally as well with ramped up repression and a more statist economy. The tragedy, of course, is that Xi Jinping, he's not more secure as a result of this system. 
In fact, I mean, I, I, one of my favorite chapter titles is State of Paranoia. Um, and that's the kind of system that he's created. And you know, Mao said to Ho Chi Minh back in 1966, he said, the more your subjects praise you, the less you can trust them. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, these uh, Xi Jinping realizes the same thing. He knows that he's putting subordinate officials under such pressure. So he naturally doesn't believe they're sincere. <laughs> and what can he do? He has to just keep putting more pressure on them and the system therefore generates more overreach. The third uh, term is likely to be even more extreme. There's no uh, reason to see any new checks emerging out of the system, which of course puts a lot of responsibility on the international response. Um, but even though my book's not a policy book, in the last chapter I do offer advice to both the Chinese side and the US side. And I advise that we should not respond to overreach with overreaction. And I'm pretty critical of US policy for overreacting. And I'm really quite worried that um, we haven't devoted enough effort to uh, diplomacy with China, although I must say the Chinese side has made it extremely difficult to do that. But, uh, but I feel, and I'm, I'm agnostic genuinely agnostic about whether or not smart diplomacy from the United States can actually still shape uh, Chinese policy. And, but I feel that we haven't really tested it adequately, uh, certainly over the last six years. So um, I'm therefore pleased to see what happened in Bali and hope that we might see some more diplomacy um, in uh, the next two years. And I think we have to also beware of the uh, downside of this bipartisan consensus about the China threat, which I believe that China actually has brought on itself by its behavior. As Joe Nye said many years ago, only China can contain China. And uh, that's really what we see happening today. But let's uh, beware of overreactions that will really harm the secret of American success, American competitiveness, and the America that we all really um, value, which is openness. So I think I'll just stop Great. right there. Thanks. Um, we started 20 minutes late, so we're going to carry on a little bit longer and allow questions. So please uh, come to the microphone if you have a question. And remember, if you're comfortable, let us know your name, your institution. And do remember that a question ends with a question mark. So. Uh, <laughs> There's a lot to think about in there. I mean, I think particularly on the overcompliance, I think you see that with the COVID shutdowns. Right. But uh, I'm sure many local officials, you know, just shutting down because that shows fealty to Xi. You could always make a mistake by not shutting down. What I hear coming out of this, though, is this tremendous tension between the way the political system is being described, what the needs are in the economy, what is being done in the economy, and the kind of social challenges uh, which Yawen was highlighting. But let's start with the uh, <clears throat> first question. Hi, um, thank you. I'm Jun, uh, a first year PhD in Kennedy School. Um, my question is, like, um, what do you think, um, like you mentioned vicious cycle but, uh, among the political circle, like distrust and then more uh, loyalty and then overreact. And also like 
uh, among like uh, between politicians and uh, the, the government and um, the society, like distrust from people uh, to uh, government and then more control. So what do you think are the potential solution to this, how to break the vicious cycle, like either in practical um, solutions or more practical, uh, practical ones given the context of China? Thank you. So that could take a couple of hours to get to, but uh, well, maybe I'll say just one one thing, which is um, there is a kind of counterfactual about how Hu Jintao, uh, who did a lot of good things in the direction of controlled opening in his first term, might have sustained it instead of. Uh, the trend toward overreach. And because there are a lot of interest groups, as you point out, who really favor a, um, a controlled opening, uh, especially the private sector, private business, intellectuals, uh, students, uh, professionals, coastal, provinces, local governments, and especially in coastal areas. And we know that there was that kind of potential coalition of groups that could have formed a counterweight to the control coalition um, because Wang Yang was giving speeches aimed at those people. And Wen Jiabao was giving speeches aimed at those interests. So there was, and I think they still exist. So um, I'm betting on society, I'm betting on local officials who now are kind of going broke because they have to pay for all this testing, constant testing in zero COVID. And uh, that's just not sustainable. So, um, you know, I think Chinese society, again, none of this is inevitable. What's happened so far, it wasn't inevitable. And uh, therefore, the future also is very difficult to predict. I think the control elements never went away in that we tended to focus on what we wanted to see. And I think Barry Norton has written about this very instructively in terms of the economy, in the sense, you know, what do we get wrong? And that we tended to think there was an inexorable move uh, towards markets, the central control was down, but it never really went away. Personally, I just think it's in the DNA of the party. It's very strong. Let's take the next uh, question of the gentleman there. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Scott Wong. I'm a student here at HLS. Um, my question has to do with the legitimacy of the party. Um, so for a long time, uh, political scientists have characterized you know, the party's uh, paternalistic rule you know, as standing from a, a performance-based uh, type of legitimacy right. on the promise that the things will look better tomorrow than today. But as our speakers have pointed out, there is now growing inequality, more visible inequality, and over-securitization and overreach um, many of the social problems. So I guess my question is, um, what do you think are the party solutions to this le legitimacy crisis? And perhaps th does the party even bother to find a solution to this problem? Thanks. So performance-based Yeah, yeah. I, I can say a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, so there is a concept called for performance legit legitimacy. So basically in the past, um, like, Social scientists think that um, like Chinese government, right, derive legitimacy from their economic, from their performance, but performance can based on economic growth. But I kind of wondering whether kind of like a bridging the gap between like the ideology and also reality could be, I don't know if that could be a source of legit legitimacy, for example, like this uh, common prosperity um, initiative. So even though it doesn't really kind of help on uh, GDP growth, but if it help, but it, if it's kind of like, uh, it, if it help um, reducing inequality, or even if it, it doesn't help, right? So we have a, um, 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 there, we have an alumna, um, uh, uh, Ding, um, Isa Ding, a graduate from Harvard, she um, 
develop the concept of performance legitimacy. Basically, the idea is that you perform is kind of like a performance, literally yeah. just performance. Show, then that show. could right a yeah. show, right? That could lead to uh, increase in legitimacy as well. So there is this component. So I think she can, can kind of do this kind of populist uh, strategy. And then even though it didn't really maybe even if the uh, campaign doesn't really reduce inequality, it's still likely that this kind of performance, just like Bo Xilai's uh, mm -hmm. initiative in Chongqing could work. Um, if you go to Chongqing nowadays, people still think Bo Xilai is a good guy, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, why don't we take next, I think there's four questions. Let's take them all together and then I'll give our panelists, each one of our panelists a chance to reply to the bits they want to or any concluding comments. So, okay, uh, I'm Michael Enright, currently at Northeastern, recently back in the US after 24 years on the ground in Hong Kong and China. Um, two of the panelists who describe uh, Xi's recent documents as schizophrenic, um, which strikes me as perhaps a way to describe the foreigners, but almost completely inappropriate to try to understand where the policies come from. In what world are these documents not schizophrenic at all, but completely consistent? Because that's the world that the people making those documents are in. And does that world allow for the sort of adjustment that will allow China to uh, adjust if it overreaches and gets response? I am Kazunori Koike, a visiting fellow at Ashton. You speak louder, please. Originally from uh, uh, Japan, Bank of Japan. I'm working for the Bank of Japan. Uh, I have a question to uh, Mr. Kruger. Uh, I for about the uh, economic development uh, model of the Chinese economy. Uh, from the economic point of view, uh, if the uh, economy is going to be more and more developed, I think uh, decision making should be diverse, not centralized. But according to your uh, uh, argument, you know, uh, the, the Chinese uh, CCP is going to uh, more centralize the uh, development, uh, sorry, decision making process, like an industrial policy. But the uh, China is already uh, so developed and uh, they have a very diversified uh, supply chain. And we do not see a reformist in the uh, uh, core leadership of the Communist Party. How do you think that the uh, past tra trajectory, uh, tra uh, development path you mentioned, uh, can be uh, achieved? Uh, can you explain a little bit more about your uh, uh, argument? Thank you. Great, thanks. Please. Hi, my name is Mabel Chan. I'm associate in research with the Fairbank Center. Uh, I just have uh, one question, and that is, um, I want to have a takeaway from today's talk from everybody's offering uh, red flags about destabilizing factors within China, because that's what we're talking about, China's realities. And as we know, China is obsessed with stability. So in your view, what is the red flag here? What is the biggest, most disruptive, threatening, destabilizing force that you see internally that is brewing right now. Uh, clearly, I've heard overreach. I've heard um, neo-totalitarianism. I've heard inequality. So if you could pinpoint the, the biggest threat to stability, uh, thank you. And last one. Thank you, thank you. Um, should we uh, should we expect um, kind of cultural genesis? When you are, uh, I'm Alan Chiu. I study uh, innovation and also geopolitics. Uh, my question is: Should we expect uh, kind of uh, a campaign of cultural genocide uh, happening to happening to Taiwan as has happened to Xinjiang? Thank you. All right, let's. Uh... Let me start with Yawen. Do you have any final comments either on these questions or a last thing you want to say? Yeah, I um, 
I don't have a lot of um, answers on these uh, complicated questions. So I have um, just put perhaps one comment on destabilizing um, like factors. So I think zero, uh, this zero policy is really, is really very, it's really too over. And I think this is the, I mean, a lot of um, Chinese people are so obedient to the government and so, um, so very kind to the government and don't complain too much. But then I think these zero policies really uh, give them a chance to see how once uh, one, once uh, people's freedom can be taken by the government. So usually like we thought they don't care about, a lot of people don't really care about surveillance technology, don't care about social credit score, just a lot of this kind of thing. But then really when your freedom is really constrained to that extent, then people begin to think about really um, the importance of freedom. So that's what I think this, this really is simply, this could lead to um, some problem. And you see there are uh, protests recently against uh, zero um, um, zero COVID policies. I think this is in the short, kind of short term, but in the long term, I, I don't really know. I think um, unemployment could be an issue because even among college students, the uh, unemployment rate is super high now that I will look forward to how the government would address the problem. But the, as many of um, the pan panelists say that the government's policy for example, crackdown on the tech sector, I mean, lead to have led to a lot of lay of, of these uh, people. So uh, there are a lot of uh, negative consequences of their policy. Great, thank you. Uh, so first on, on Michael Enright's question, yeah, I think that's a very fair uh, terminological uh, correction. Um, you know, I think what we're highlighting here are um, that there are real tensions uh, between competing policy agendas in a very complicated world, and that leads to um, statements and 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 policy movements that um, sometimes don't seem completely aligned. So I, th I think you're right to point out that what looks to us somewhat contradictory um, is a is in fact a, a real attempt to to grapple with a very complicated set of cross-cutting problems. And of course, I think it's also important to, to remember that you know, this party Congress speech has a large political component to it. So it's, I think we can't really take every word in it purely at face value. It has certain kind of signaling functions. Um, and as we can see in our own political system, uh, it is not the case that uh, leaders of any stripe are always 100% consistent in the policies that they pursue and the ways that they message them. So I, I think that's a very fair point. Um, on the centralized decision-making thing, yeah, I mean, I, I think long-term, clearly it's a bad idea for uh, centralization, uh, centralized decision-making to become too, too extreme. I think the question mark in the short run is, you could imagine uh, a situation in the next few years where Xi Jinping takes advantage of this highly centralized system where at the top, everyone is sort of on his team to push through some very big things. I mean, Yawen mentioned the property tax, which is would be a major, uh, a, a mechanism for pursuing a real common prosperity agenda. Um, it hasn't been um, uh, implemented in the past because it's uh, been run into too many political obstacles. But if there's anyone who has an ability to steamroll over those political obstacles and vested interests, it's Xi Jinping and his team right now. So I, I'm not sure I would bet on that, but I, I think we should leave uh, open the possibility that the next few years of uh, this centralization could potentially be used to push through some things that were just in the too hard bucket before. Okay, well, um, first I just wanna put in a plug for Susan's terrific new book, you know, Christmas is coming, it makes a great gift for your loved ones. <laughs> And I will collect later. No, truly, I've read it cover to cover. It's superb. Um, I'm really also really intrigued and pleased that uh, Yalen uh, raised the, the other definition of performance legitimacy. It reminds me, since we're here in Cambridge, of Lucian Pai, who was Susan's doctoral supervisor, who wrote, of course, a lot about political culture in Chinese politics and about the theater of Chinese politics, um, by which he um, meant the uh, the need to biao tai to um, you know declare where you stand to constantly prove you know in a false way uh, your loyalty 
to either a co-how, to a slogan, or to the leader. Uh, there's a falsity, Lucian argued, to this. There's a veneer. It's a false veneer, this kind of performance. This is what we're seeing in, in Xi Jinping's China today. Um, so thanks for that other definition performance. Uh, Michael Enright, good to see you again, asks, um, what world is there where the work report is consistent and not contradictory or schizophrenic? Well, the work report is not written for foreigners, first of all. It's written, as Arthur just said, for internal audiences. But the um, world is the echo chamber inside the party um, world of these, these theoreticians and institutes that literally draft it, um, which Tony and I and others spent a lot of time going to these, interacting with these uh, people. Um, they live in their own little universe. So I think that's that's the point. It's not contradictory to them, <laughs> even though it is to us. And then the last uh, question I'll address was the question about destabilize. What's the most destabilizing force in China today? I would say it is exactly the type of overcentralized, personalized, robotic, repressive, dictatorial party we've been talking about today that she has created. The system itself is the most um, destabilizing force and dangerous factor in China today. Um, can Chinese decision makers, Xi Jinping, adjust policies, moderate policies to reduce the costs that are piling up um, domestic as well as international? Um, I, I would think Yes, that he can, because as we've said, he certainly has the authority to do so. Um, nobody's going to stop him. And let's remember, let's go back to the third plenum in 2013. This remarkable document, uh, agenda for reform, not just economic reform, legal system, all sorts of things. What was that all about? I mean, it seems to have been part of his original uh, policy of trying to build a broad coalition of different interest groups. But then of course, almost none of it was carried out. But it does provide a kind of agenda if he wanted to uh, revive that reform impulse and appeal to those groups once again. Um, in terms of the greatest risks, though, to China's internal political stability, I think it's the complete lack of power sharing at the top and the um, and therefore uh, all the other senior politicians in the Chinese Communist Party who, you know, uh, have no sense of sharing in power, patronage, their own career security is at risk. And um, and also, they're certainly dissatisfied with the quality of decisions that Xi Jinping has made and the consequences for China. So of course, the problem is there is no figure, as I think David said, uh, discontent or dissatisfaction doesn't equal opposition. But I, you know, and, Coordinating an opposition is extremely difficult. There are all sorts of rules. They're not allowed to talk to one another directly. They're under increased surveillance. Even retired officials just in the last six months ago, there are new regulations that put retired officials under more intense uh, surveillance and control. So, um, but remember what how many people have been impacted by the large numbers of officials who have been disciplined, put into jail or otherwise punished. Their families are very, I mean, they must hate Xi Jinping. Yep. 
And so there's not an insignificant group of people who have a lot of reason to be very, very unhappy with Xi Jinping. Great. I actually have a very different interpretation of the November plenum, but that's for another uh, event. Well, we started 20 minutes late, and now we're only 30 minutes behind <laughs> schedule. So I think we're doing pretty impressively this morning. But please join me in thanking our panelists for a lot of the Oh, no. So we've got a 10-minute break. Uh, meet back 11.10. Thank you very much.